what I have found always in, in my life, like for the last couple decades, what I always wanted was an empty calendar. And I, I think that that is, it, it sounds so so boring in a way, right? Because it's just, what, else, what are you going to do? Well, I can choose what I want to do at any given time. And this week, our conversation is one of two things on my calendar like for the whole week right now. So that that's the life that I always wanted to have, where I can, you know, s- schedule my time and my day, do the things that I want to do without having somebody else impede on my work or my, my distribution of tasks or whatever without my consent. When that's something that entrepreneurship, that be, being your own um, boss effectively allows for. Arvid, thanks for joining the episode. Really appreciate you coming on. Pleasure. I'm quite excited. Me too. Uh, and I wanted to just start off by just noting a few of your uh, biography a little bit uh, and sort of knock off a few things here. So you're an entrepreneur, software engineer, podcast host, writer, author of two books, Twitter nerd, brand builder, and just an overall nice guy. How do you, uh, how do, you do it all? And, and why are you doing all this? <laughs> oh, I, I love the why question. I mean, the how is, is really quickly answered. I started with one thing and then I slowly added the others. And it's, it's kind of, I've been thinking about this a lot over the last couple of weeks because I reached like episode 200 of my podcast, which is quite the c- consistency goal that I had. And then I reached it and I was extremely baffled that I actually made it that far. Right? Just 200 episodes of anything, the consistency on, uh, on a weekly basis. I never thought I'd be able to do this, but I was because I started writing. I started just writing articles. And then over time, I kind of turned them into newsletters because if you have an article, I might just as well send it as an email. right? And then once that was established and I had this kind of accountability system, I started reading or narrating, I guess, that article into a microphone, the very microphone that I'm currently speaking into. And I had a podcast all of a sudden. And then I turned on the camera filming myself while I was talking into that microphone. And then I had a YouTube episode. It was really just like synergy upon synergy, like a tiny little addition to the things that I was already doing. And all of this is one process, one kind of flywheel, right? I go on Twitter to communicate with my audience, the people who buy my books, the people who read my blog posts, who listen to my podcast and so on. And having these conversations then introduces me to new topics that I can write about the next week, right? It's it's kind of a, a gigantic flywheel of content that I produce, that I consume, that I deliver right on, or that just have conversations with people about. It's, it's all... Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's all part of, of a, a bigger kind of system that has established itself over time. And the why is probably the more interesting part here. Honestly, when, when I sold my, my software as a service business back in 2019, I, I had built a pretty enjoyable little SaaS business in the online teacher productivity space called Feedback Panda with my partner, with Danielle, um, my life partner and business partner, which is a wonderful combination. Can talk about that too. That's really enjoyable. Um, we sold that business two years into it um, existing. And after that, I felt I really needed something enjoyable in my life that gave me the same amount of passion that I got from serving thousands of online English teachers that were doing like a second, third job just to make ends meet and we help them accomplish that goal. There was an incredible sense of purpose in that. And we gave it away effectively by, you know, selling the business. We gave the purpose away with the business too. And I needed something in my life that could recreate that that purpose. And I found that fortunately in writing and I found that in the community I was writing for, which is the online indie hacker space, the creator space, the maker space, people who want to build stuff for other people, who want to solve other people's problems. And through writing and then podcasting and then doing video and all of these things together, I found that purpose again. And that is the why. And that also, coming back to what I just said about 200 episodes of something, that to me at least explains why I am still doing this, why I'm consistently doing this every single week. Because every single week I see somebody in my audience, which has now grown to a c- completely unimaginable and incomprehensible numbers, like a six figure audience. I never thought I would ever get anywhere close to this, but apparently here I am. So I see in this audience people who benefit today from what I have written a year ago. I literally see them building businesses from the advice, from the structures, the frameworks that I presented to them 
and applying that to their life and having success with it, like, how could I not continue? Right. This is such a, the feedback loop of, of our community that I find myself to be a part of is so strong over time in the short and in the long time that I just have no reason to ever stop this. And that's the why, that's why I keep doing this. I think you released an episode uh, or a podcast or everything basically, basically in that flywheel about consistency. Mm -hmm. And that resonated with me a lot. And I feel like a lot of people give up too easily and mm -hmm. they don't see because they're waiting for gains and not waiting for the long term and, and not waiting it out to sort of see what happens. And you mentioned something about accountability and you mentioned about the fact that there were so many, if there was one person that read your article, that was enough to continue to write because you've affected, effectively made someone's you know, day, or you've given them information that they wouldn't otherwise access. I think that's so powerful. And I feel like a lot more people need to have that sort of mindset. And I wonder why people are, find it so difficult to be consistent, especially in a day, a day and age where you're producing, you know, content creation is hard. You have to put in the effort. You have to put in the quality and the consistency. Why, why is consistency so hard? And why did you make a video on it? Well, well, look at who we glorify. Maybe that's an important part. Like, who do we look up to in our communities, right? And those are usually people who are super successful, who are outstandingly successful, who are have been around for sometimes decades, but we don't see this. We just see their most recent thing, right? We, we very much tend to look only at the highlight reel of somebody's life in our social media world where we just glorify and, and glamorize certain things and ignore the others that we don't fit into the things that we want the perfect life to be like. And that sets, that sets up these high expectations that people have, like what you just said, that the expectation that you have immediate results and returns from putting some effort into something, right? But if you look at most careers, of people who end up successful. And if you look in the founder space in particular, the, the, the entrepreneurial software founder or essentially any founder of any kind of business, most people who succeed are in their 30s or 40s. So they, and then they've been at it for a decade. It's not that they started in their 30s or 40s, right? They started early in life and worked through a lot of failure, a lot of mistakes, a lot of things that didn't work or kind of worked, but not enough. And then had they had to pivot to something or get a job again or find a different industry to work in. You don't see much of that story, but you see the glamorized, super glorified story of them here today. And that's just, I think, sensationalism that we generally have in media. It's just the way we communicate, right? The thing that captures our attention is the outstanding, the outlier, not the regular kind of average journey. So, yeah, if, if that is an answer, I don't know if it is, but I feel like that is if what we look to is what we aim for, right? What what we see is is where we want to go. And if we only look at people's highlight reels instead of looking at their whole journey, which most people don't present because there are social etiquettes and, and certain reasons why we don't talk about our failures much because we fear to be embarrassed in front of people or to disappoint people who think that we are without fail for some reason. We don't talk about this as much, but more and more people are with the whole build in public movement. They share the ups and the downs. And now we get to see the journeys as they happen, not just as we look at them in retrospect. And all of a sudden, consistency becomes much more affordable, both in, in terms of time and energy that we have, because we see other people struggling and still persevering. Well, now we can put the same energy in and see maybe not everything works out all the time, but it does seem to work out eventually. So the answer, I guess, is, well, people don't know that it sometimes takes much longer um, than you expect for certain things. I actually listened to a podcast a couple of days ago, and um, it's, it's an audiobook. It's called Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality. I don't know if you heard about this, but it's kind of a, if you know the less wrong community, it's kind of a online community forum. And um, that they, they wrote, or that the, the kind of the leader of that community wrote this hilarious Harry Potter book, kind of just explaining the idea of rationality, certain kind of biases, certain kind of concepts that we have, cognitive uh, dissonances and stuff. 
in terms of a fantasy book. It's really cute and adorable. And what, what he was talking about in that book, in that Harry Potter <laughs> fan fiction, so to say, was that most people, when they look at any process that they go through and are asked to estimate if the, the likelihood that they will be done with it at a certain point, they completely overestimate the average case because people f look at a process and they think, well, on average, it's probably going to work out. Right. And they look at it and they see kind of the best case scenario, but they can trick themselves into thinking that this is the average scenario. So all of a sudden, what you think is going to take eight hours, very likely is going to take 20, even in the average case. And that estimation, that bias that we have towards overestimating how good something will go, how well it will go, that is everywhere, particularly in long-term efforts where we don't know the outcome, which entrepreneurship by design is, right? It, it, you, that's the idea. You undertake something new. That's what entrepreneurship is. And you, you do something that nobody else has done exactly this way before. So you are, don't have any guaranteed results to begin with, but you also don't really have anything to go for when you want to kind of explore how long things will take. You completely uh, underestimate how long things will take. And then people give up. They give up because they think they should have seen results by now and they haven't. And yeah, that's, that kind of leaves them stranded. I think there's something to be said about determination as well and mm -hmm. and not necessarily you know being smart is one thing but being more determined is, is another and i would choose determinism over being intelligent every day because it's the grind it's sort of waking up every day turning up showing up when you don't have to but you need to and you want to and and just doing something that you enjoy and and knowing that even if it doesn't affect the number of people you want, at least it's going to make you happy at the end of the day. And I think that goes hand in hand with why there's a lot of people going into sort of that indie community being starting to be in their own sort of solopreneurs or entrepreneurs and seeing exactly where this could take them. For you, obviously you didn't come, you, you never were a solopreneur to begin with. Obviously, you know, we all start working at corporate jobs and, you know, working at large companies. And then eventually, you know, we break off and we start to do our own thing and see what that looks like. What was your journey a little bit from sort of getting into the um, sort of indie community, but sort of leading up to that? I think it'll be interesting to learn a bit more about how you sort of developed and how you came to a decision to become more, um, in tune with becoming more of a solopreneur. I'd love to sort of learn more about your story there. Mm -hmm. So I, I went through many different kinds of software engineering jobs. That's always been my, my career. I was always interested in computers. I went to the university for computer science, dropped out, but still went, you know, and had a job during those days. I, I was actually kind of recruited away from university at a, at a point through Twitter back in 2012. Um, which got me into the actual industry. And from there, I went like to a venture capital funded Silicon Valley company. I, I worked for German traditional software companies, which are highly traditional. I can tell you that's very interesting to see like the, the complete opposite of Silicon Valley embodied still in the software world. It's, it's bizarre, but I consulted a lot. I worked, um, started a couple bootstrap businesses, but more looking for funding more in the, the VC adjacent space. And throughout all of this journey, I was always a, a software engineer, always a coder. And I think it was mostly through being in the software engineering communities that I was introduced to the indie hacking world, not through the entrepreneurial side, because I was never really in touch with the indie hacking part, mostly just a, a kind of more traditional or more like funding focused uh, people. And if those people don't know about it, they will not introduce you to it. But it was through meetups that I went to JavaScript meetups and um, Elixir, which is another programming language that is not as popular, but it's a wonderful one. And I, I used to work at a full-time job that used the Elixir programming language. And through that community of other Elixir programmers in the city I was working, I was introduced to the indie hacking space. Honestly, I don't think I ever talked about this before because it, it kind of feels like um, this is something that just kind of happens when you're on Twitter. You, you find this community at some point, but I, 
I think it was through, uh, yeah, a, a programming community where there was already an overlap between the coders and the indie hackers. And that was kind of pulled into that from there. Unfortunately, back in the day, I, I was commuting from Berlin to Hamburg, which are two big German cities that are roughly three hours away by car or train. And I was on a train multiple days a week. And I had a lot of time at that point. And I was just consuming all kinds of like, audiobooks and podcasts and blog posts on the train because you can't really do much if you're sitting in a metal tube, like zooming through the country. So that, that was a a big uh, time investment that I was able to do into learning from the community. I think I listened to every single episode of the Indie Hackers podcast at that point, and it was already at a hundred or so episodes back then. Um, you know, I just took it all in and that exposed me to the community and the people in it and the concepts of it at large while I was still working for a more or less traditional software company. And I think that that made a big difference to have the, the financial backbone of having a job and learning of and from the community in my spare time or, you know, during the commute. I think that's that's one of, and, and I should pr probably say this right here about all of the things that I'm talking about. I think I'm highly privileged in many, many ways, particularly now that I've sold a business because the life that I now lead being a media person, essentially, I don't want to call myself an influencer because this is such a heavily um, sh overshadowed wor word by, you know, by so many meanings, but I do have some influence and I, I take that and I try to teach people through this, right? But the, the benefits that I have from having sold a business, from not having to work on, you know, gainful employment and being in Canada, which is a great country that is quite supportive of all these things and having a, a stable family and a home and all of this are benefits that not everybody has. So when I talk about entrepreneurship and being a creator, I do this from a highly privileged position. I just want to acknowledge that. And even back then, I had a full-time job that was paying super well in a city and people paid me for the commute. So I was riding the train for free and I could like learn for free on somebody else's dime. All of this is highly privileged. So I just want to say not everybody might have this opportunity, but the information itself to learn off and from this community, that was always free and always available. And maybe that makes a difference here. Do you think that that's the dream? I mean, there's a lot of people out there, not just engineers, but people who are trying to build their own thing and, oh, well, not necessarily build their own thing, but they're in a job, they're kind of, paid well they're living a nice life and you know they're it's comfortable for them you know does does being uh you know an indie hacker or you know a solopreneur um open a gateway for you to other things that you might not realize i think there's a lot of flexibility a lot of freedom associated with it is that really why a lot of people do this or they're doing this for other reasons well i think we all have a dream Right? We don't have the dream. We don't necessarily all have um, the, the same imagination when it comes to what the perfect life would be looking like. But being an entrepreneur, a successful entrepreneur, by the way, uh, gives you a lot of opportunities that you might not have if you don't have control over your own destiny. And I think that is something that most people's dreams are about, right? Having control over your own life not having to follow somebody else, but being the person that defines the, the terms of their own lives. So if there's anything about the dream that is very unique to each of us, it's probably about living a life as we, as we see, like with the optimal distribution of control. And most of the time, that's probably maximum control with me. Other people, they might love the life of an, of an employee, right? Knowing that the nine to five is where they make money and everything beyond that is free to use for whatever leisure they want and they don't have to think a second about their job, that can also be a dream. But it comes with similar limitations, just different, right? They, the limitations of a nine to five are that you're kind of beholden to somebody else and the, the economic impact that you make on somebody else's business are not reflected in the wealth that you accumulate, at least not financially most of the time. But as an entrepreneur, you have the potential to create a lot of wealth, but you also have a massive downside, which is entrepreneurial risk. And right? it comes with many different shapes of forms. But if your own money is on the line for your business, which most of the time it is for bootstrappers or self-funded entrepreneurs, then all of a sudden there is no safety net anymore, depending, of course, also on the country in which you live. And 
most people that speak this language that we're currently speaking are living in the States or in, uh, you know, in, in Canada or in, in the UK. Of course, there are many people in the world who speak English, but you know, the, the major, majority of people who listen to this will be in the United States, but there's not much of a social net for entrepreneurs, social safety net and healthcare and all that kind of stuff is, is terribly hard to come by as a founder. So there are massive downsides to that potential massive upside as well. So again, the dream probably is very much just an, an, an extension of somebody's risk tolerance that they have, right? Some people may just want to go for the biggest thing possible in their life, become billionaires or not, or not, or fail horribly at it, which can be their dream. And other people just want to cushy something that they can rely on. But for me, for myself, what I have found always in, in my life, like for the last couple of decades, what I always wanted was an empty calendar and I think that that is, it sounds so, so boring in a way, right? Because it's just, what else, what are you going to do? Well, I can choose what I want to do at any given time. And this week, our conversation is one of two things on my calendar, like for the whole week right now. So that, that's the life that I always wanted to have where I can, you know, schedule my time and my day, do the things that I want to do without having somebody else impede on my work or my, my distribution of tasks or whatever without my consent. When that's something that entrepreneurship, that be, being your own um, boss effectively allows for. I think there's something to be said also about the owning of owning your calendar. I think with so many meetings nowadays, with so many people that you may not necessarily want to meet, I think there are ways where maybe it's time to stream, you know, strip down the calendar a little bit, take more ownership and figure out exactly who do you want to meet? Who do you want to talk to? Is it important? Can it be done by email? And uh, and I think, especially for me, Zoom conversations and, and just those which can drain a lot out of you because there's just so many things that have to deal with and, and, and inter interrelationships that you have to, to uh, engage. So for me, I think the calendar side of things, but also, yeah, you mentioned, you know, the freedom of having the flexibility to do whatever you want i suppose and and having the the say look i'm waking up and i'm going to do this and do that and that's completely within my control and you can you know have it any way you want i mean i still have a pretty regimented week right i still have a structure to my work and my uh, the, the days of the week that i have because i want to accomplish the things that monetize the business that i'm currently building Right? What, what I'm currently doing is I'm building a media business, building a media company that is a newsletter that has sponsors or a podcast that has sponsors and a YouTube channel that will soon be monetized. If more people, <laughs> if more people watch my videos, I, I get there. But you know, it's, it's a, it's an, an ongoing effort for a system like this to sustain itself and to grow. Like just a couple months ago, I started hiring a designer for my YouTube thumbnails. And I now have somebody else working for me to deal with my transcription of the videos, the interviews that I have, because I don't want to do it myself. And even though you can automate a lot of this, having a person look into this is always nice. So I'm hiring people now to do the work that makes the quality of my content better. And for that, I need to pay them. And for that, for that, my content needs to be monetized more. So I need to reach out to sponsors and that takes time. And, you know, over, it's just, it's, it's becoming a bit business. What was just me writing stuff and talking into a microphone is now depending on me to reliably recruit sponsors into the process so I can pay my employees. And that still is a business, but it's mine, right? I know that anything I do, any value that I create will flow back to me and cumulative, cumulatively increase the value of the thing that I'm building. And since I don't really want to sell this, I can do this for however long I want to do th this particular thing. And I can start hiring people to do the tasks that I don't enjoy and just do the thing that I enjoy, which is talking into a microphone about things that interest me, right? And looking at a camera while doing this. That's kind of my hope, the whole thing <laughs> for me right now. And and there's also like the, the idea of, look, um, even if it doesn't go well, let's say one project doesn't go well, I can always pivot and I can, yeah. you know, go backwards and say, I, that didn't work. Let's try something else. And you can always start to experiment. And I think that's a really cool way of trying new things and not be trapped by dogma and say, okay, this is how it was done in the past, but it's not working. But, you know, why isn't it working for me? And I feel like there's a lot of room for improvement, and especially in the podcasting world. There's so much stuff going on right now and it's going to, It'd be interesting to see how that evolves and how content creation create becomes much more, um, you know, 
ubiquitous, um, especially in social media and all those things and getting your message out there with the, with the stuff that you, you know, obviously getting into indie hacking and, and sort of building out your business and everything. Was there a point where, you know, you, you and your partner, you said, obviously your life partner, you worked on this together. And I think it's an interesting situation to be in. And this can go both ways. It can go, <laughs> it can go both ways. So how was the relationship in building a company or business in general with a partner that you love, but also that you spend a lot of time with? It's a long, enduring journey. Is there anything that can be said about the pros and cons of owning a business uh, with a life partner? Oh, there's a lot that can be said about that. I've actually been talking to a lot of couples uh, over the last couple of years that have similar situations that also like founded businesses together. And there are very, very common threats in every story, right? It, the, it, it really boils down to how capable are you to communicate honestly and earnestly with each other. That is the baseline for all of this. Like if you are in a relationship and we fortunately were where we had already established a way of communicating between each other about the good and the bad before we started the business. We just took that way of communicating just honestly, clearly, directly and applied it to business communication too. So that, that is one of the, the things that you need to get right because that allows you, if it works, to just very be very clear about where does your business persona end and where does your home persona begin. That was something that we really had to figure out because we were in Berlin at the time. We were in a very small apartment. We had essentially two bedrooms. One was the actual bedroom. The other one was the office. And then there was a smallish living room with a kitchen right in it. So it was just a really tiny apartment. And that was the place that we spent all of our time in because we both worked remotely and we had to work from this space. And that was the, the bigger one. Before that, we, we lived in an apartment that had one room less. So we were just in the living room together all the time. That allowed us to establish our communication pattern because if that hadn't worked out, we probably would have split up at some point to be, to be quite honest because that was a very stressful, potentially stressful time that we managed to deal with and establish a communication regimen around. And we, we took that and uh, implemented it for the business too. So the benefit is if you work well with your partner in real life, you can very likely work well with them in your business provided a couple things. A, what I said, communication pattern established. B, clear delineation of competence and responsibilities. That is something that we did from the beginning. Just, we just said, you're going to be the CEO. I'm going to be the CTO. Anything social media, that's going to be you. Anything finances is going to be me. And this is not just about doing the work because we often would do the work of the other person too if needed, but it's about the, the point of responsibility. Who has the final word? That is something that we kind of, we, we, we drew a big map of a potential company. If we had like 50 employees, we put that on a whiteboard. We just said, which roles would a company that is that big five years from now have CEO, CFO, CMO, and software engineer front end, software engineer back end. We just had a, an org chart, a fictional org chart of a company on a whiteboard. And then we put our names to each position. And every job that would have been done by some person that we would have to hire in the future was done by either me or by Danielle at some point, right? In the beginning. And over time, we filled it with more and other people starting from the bottom and moving up. But in the beginning it was just two of us and we split it half and half. She got 25 roles. I got 25 roles. And whenever there was a job that needed a decision to be made about something, we would figure out where on the org chart the decision would happen and the name next to it would make that choice. And that completely removed any ambiguity about decision-making from, from our um, process, which made it way less stressful because it was right there. It was right on the, on the whiteboard. And that helped us a lot. Um, drawbacks to this? Well, I, I guess you, it, you can't complain about your boss if your boss is your wife. Right. And, and that's kind of the case with us. Like Danielle was, Danielle was the CEO of the business and I, she was essentially making all the choices. I didn't really have anybody to complain to about stuff that I didn't like, but we're adults we can figure this out. Right. And we have friends and we have other opportunities to, to deal with these kind of feelings. And we could still communicate about these things. We, we actually very clearly said, I'm talking to you as a partner, or if you were doing business stuff, I'm talking to you as your business partner right now. Life partner, business partner. That was often the preface to a conversation. So it was very clear who is talking and that, that made it easy. 
I've seen people struggle with this. Um, couples struggle with this particular part of communicating and that first breaks their business and then it breaks their relationship. So it, there is always risk in this. A benefit to the whole thing is that what we have created together brought us closer together too. Like if you build a business like this, of course, it's not a child, right? You can call it your baby however much you want. It's a business. It doesn't love you back, but it is a, a joint project that you took over many years and grew it into something meaningful. And that is, is relationship glue. Like whenever we run into a problem now that we have a, an argument or something, we always know that we overcame so many obstacles in the past, growing this thing to profitability and then selling it and then changing our lives through it, right? That's always just, it, it just raises the level of, I don't care about this problem compared to the things we did in the past. This is nothing. It, there, a lot of things are nothing compared to the things that we overcame in the past. So that really helps. Yeah. That's one of the, one of the biggest things really is. Yeah. I mean, that's one thing. And, and yeah, like I said, it, it can go both ways for you and in a very great direction. And you learn a lot about the other person, right? Oh and yeah. You, that's right. you get to see a little bit about the idiosyncrasies, how they, how they operate in an office environment, a corporate environment versus a personal relationship. And there is definitely a lot of, um, you know, ways that you can view someone in those types of conditions. So I'm, I'm really happy that you were able to sort of work together well, uh, with your partner and, and, and build something great. When, when the day came, when obviously I don't want to get into the numbers, but when there was an opportunity for an exit for you, you know, what was that like? I think there's a lot of people. The reason I asked this question is not just so much to sort of, um, understand the amounts, but also, but really understand there's a lot of people who want to build something great and they're hoping one day, you know, they'll, they're going to toil away and something might happen and they want to, obviously this is going to take a long time because we've already discussed it takes, you know, it takes time and effort and perseverance. But if there is an opportunity for someone to get an exit, how should they prepare themselves? How should they mentally? Um, and, you know, what should they expect out of that entire experience? Ooh, yeah, that uh, there's a lot in this question. There's there's a lot in this question because you wouldn't think that it takes so much effort and energy to go through an exit. But it, it is an incredibly, um, not maybe maybe not stressful, but high tension process. Because there's something extremely valuable that changes hands. And you want it to go right. You want it to go right for yourself, obviously, because you don't want to be left with any liabilities. But you also want it to go right for the people that buy your business because it's supposed to be valuable, right? And if it's not, then you're kind of running into this problem that you might really lose your reputation with everybody in this industry that you're still operating in. So there's a lot on the line. Um, let's maybe talk about um, the, the mental challenges of this, because for me, selling the business was a consequence of me being very close, if not mid burnout at that point, as one of two founders of a two person business. I was the only technical person in a business that was making $55,000 in monthly recurring revenue that was serving 5,000 customers at the same time. And we were two people dealing with all of this. So there was a lot on the line. Uh, just from the business perspective that we were, if there was a problem, it was always me that would have to solve it in terms of any, anything technical, anything data related or integration related, software related. It was always me. And I raised my baseline anxiety level to, you know, probably around uh, very high, right? It was just an incredibly tense state to be in. And I, I felt burnout coming and I felt myself just feeling detaching a little bit. And then when people reached out to us and saw that we were at this mark, like over 500K in yearly and annual revenue, they were saying, okay, this is a good business to purchase and started conversing with us. Then y'all took up the, the lead here and negotiated a really amazing sales price. And, and then we went through the, the whole motions of, you know, letter of interest and then the due diligence process and all that. But the technical things you can, you can figure out technical things. There, there are books out there. I think um, one, one of the most uh, interesting books on this topic was released last year by John Warrillow. I think it's called the art of selling a business. 
which is like if you want to ever exit your business, you don't need to read it just like minutes before you exit. You can read it right now to know what to prepare for in terms of which documents you need and how to best approach like separating your accounts, personal accounts from your business accounts. All of that is in that book. One thing that I want to share here is um, something that was very surprising to me. Uh, throughout the process and after selling the business and something that probably did did more um, or could have done more mental health damage to me if I hadn't thought about it before a little bit by just talking to people that were also founders that had sold their business. And that was, I, I just said, we built something together, right? Danielle and I, we built this business that was helping thousands of people. And that is... Again, not like a human person that you lose when you sell it, but there is grief involved. Like you lose something that is a source of purpose and a source of passion. There's the connections that you have with your customers, as annoying as they might be sometimes, you know, all these customer service conversations where people just complain about something not working can be annoying. But in the end, you help this person. They are thankful. They're grateful. You have a connection with them. There's a relationship there. And if somebody buys your business, you hand over all these relationships. It's like you give away your friends. They're not your friends. They're like, you know, they're just uh, customers in a way, but still you give away real relationships, business relationships, but still real human relationships. And that kind of tears something out of you. It's, it's, it was super surprising to me because I thought, Hey, I'm going to sell my business. I'm going to have these gigantic amounts of money on my account. I'm just going to be gaming all day and living the life. Well, no, I was sitting there feeling that I've just lost my purpose. Like it was the, the void that I fell into after we sold the business was so surprisingly intense. I was like sitting there, what am I going to do now? I mean, like 24 seven for the last two years, I was helping these people solve their problems. And they were telling me that I was actually making a meaningful impact in their lives. And now I'm sitting here and I'm thinking about playing a game. Now that's not going to help. It's not the same level of impact, right? And I was just sitting there and, and freaking out over not having this, this purpose, this passion in my life anymore. So that was something I, and I knew it was coming. People told me of the void, like the concept of this post exit void. Every founder goes through this. Every founder feels this in some capacity. And it doesn't matter if you sell your business for, I don't know, $10,000 because it's just like a couple months old or $10 million after a couple of years. The void is always there because the money, as great as it is, is just like a reflection of the economic value of the business. But the, the kind of, again, I don't know if, if passion has, has an adjective here, but like how passionate you are about this business and how intense these relationships are with your customers, money does not reflect this. And getting money does not make it okay for these things to be gone. The human mind is a social mind, right? The number, that's, that's math, but the connection, that is a real thing for, for you. And I, I felt this super strongly. So if you are a founder ever thinking of selling your business, you really need to consider what you're going to be doing after that, that gives you an equal or maybe bigger amount of the passion and purpose in your life, because that is something that you don't know that you lost it until you use it, you lose it. It was, it was a really strong emotional moment for me and for Danielle too. Like she was also feeling grief the same way. And she was also trying to figure out what to do with her life after that. It was, it was a pretty intense phase for both of us. And it, it really didn't help that we sold in, I think July, 2019. And when everything was done, it was like December, 2019. It was like literally seven days before the pandemic hit that we were done with our sale. And we were just going to go on the, our first, like the year the, yeah, in 2020, I think early 2020, we were just going to go on a little vacation that we wanted to uh, in Northern Europe. And it was like days before that the virus hit that country, Finland, that we wanted to go to. I was like, okay, I guess now, now what are we going to do? <laughs> because now we were locked at home. It was a bizarre time. So yeah, it's, it can be quite stressful to, to not deal with it. How did you and Daniel get over that then? If you, if there was a gaping hole in your life, obviously, you know, you found an avenue, which is the creator stuff, the mm -hmm. connecting with the community. Um, you know, are there other avenues where people can say, look, maybe I need to build something else. Maybe I need to travel for a little bit. You know, I think everyone is probably different, but yeah, I think, I think there's a lot of existential questions to ask about, well, what do I do now? I've, I've put my life into this project and finally it's paid off, but I don't feel the way that I want to feel. I feel elated. I feel great, but at the same time, I feel sad. So 
you know, how, how did you and Daniel get over that? Well, we just tried different things. And I think the first thing we did but before um, the pandemic locked up all of the world, we, we did have a little vacation. We, we, we took some time off and we said, we need to um, completely remove ourselves from this tech world. We're going to take a week and we're just going to go to South Africa and look at the giraffes. And that's what we did. And it was probably the, the best thing we could have done because A, it, it just removed you completely from all of this business entrepreneurial stuff. You're just sitting there and you're looking at like a, a leopard tearing apart a gazelle or something. It's just like the reality of nature. It just pulls you out of all of this highly abstracted human thinking. <laughs> and B, it's probably not going to help me much, but the cell phone reception there was much better than in Europe. <laughs> like we were sitting on these safari cars and because there's nobody else there and the, the, the cell towers are still there, right? There's still people living in, in Kruger National Park and stuff. Uh, we had amazing cell reception there. <laughs> I, I don't think this is helping my cause, but it, you kind of want to detach, right? You, you want to get away from it just to see what you want to go back to. That was something that I realized because it wasn't that I was fed up with like software engineering. Or I was fed up with building businesses. And I realized that when I was sitting on that car looking at animals. It was like, no, I'm, I'm just fed up on not controlling my life. I was fed up on being so anxious about things malfunctioning because I hadn't hired anybody to help me. I was, I was uh, fed up with being kind of uh, dependent on other people's work to work so I don't have to do stuff. It was just the realization that I, the next thing I want to do in my life is something where I don't have to respond to a customer service ticket. That was what helped me. So I detached myself and I went back to the things that I liked, which was still talking about programming, still talking about entrepreneurship, but not building a SaaS business this time around. Right. And that's kind of when I started writing because one of the things that really helped me with my burnout was a, a tiny little article. Tiny. It was 10,000 words of an article that I wrote as a cathartic experiment. I was there just feeling so messed up that I needed to write. I needed to get it out. I needed to tell myself what I needed to do. So I wrote this article about like what to do to build a more stable software as a service business from the mental health perspective. I never released it, but it was the foundational moment when I noticed, oh, writing is actually helpful. For me at this moment, as a person who's struggling through this strong stress and anxiety moment, just writing this out and, and just reading my own thoughts reflected back at me, that is helping me in this moment already. And something clicked after we sold because I, I recognized, well, if I can do this for myself, I can do this for others. And that's when I started writing. And then combining my ambition to help other people with their mental health challenges with my willingness to never ever again having to reply to a support ticket. Well, that left me with, you know, a blog and a podcast and a newsletter. It's funny. I still started another SaaS business in between. So I still occasionally uh, have to respond to support tickets, but it's a, it's a very self-contained, simple solution to a specific problem that I had while writing my books. And I'm not going to grow this beyond just a couple dozen of customers to make it self-sustainable. But, you know, it's, it's still, uh, I still couldn't stop myself from building more businesses, but I needed a, at least a year and a half to just have control over my own life to get my anxiety back down. I had physical responses to anxiety, like sweating and, and stomach issues, issues I never had before in my life that came up literally through this mental challenge that I was going through. So yeah, I made it my mission to help people not to fall into these holes too far without knowing that the holes are there and how to climb back out of them. Yeah, that's, that's really good advice. And I think for a lot of people out there, they will go through those ups and downs. They will be, and it doesn't matter if you're a solopreneur, you're just trying to build a business. I mean, it's going to take a lot of effort and you're going to go through highs and ups and downs and everything. But more specifically, I think if you are a solopreneur, you know, you either have yourself by yourself or you're working with very, very, you know, a small group of people, like a, a crack team of people that you know very well. And that is... Um, can be stressful at times. So if I was an indie hacker and I'm trying to build something and I wanted to share with the world, I wanted to be successful, I want all the good stuff to come in, how would you prescribe based on everything that you've learned so far? You know, how do you become 
a successful indie hacker? I know it's a very, very broad question and it will be different for everyone, but is there a recipe or is there anything that you can say to someone trying to get into the, that space and anything you can share about, whether it be about consistency that we spoke about, it could be about mental health, or it could just be about just, you know, build a great product that people will love. You know, well, be what's, something that, what's something that you can uh, speak to about that? Okay, I, I, I started this conversation talking about um, who we look at and who we imitate, right? We, we had this earlier, like who, who do we glorify in our community? And one thing that I would ask anybody who is uh, getting into the space is to be extremely mindful not to start imitating the people who stand out the most from the beginning. Like we have great indie hackers in the space, like Peter Levels and, you know, like all these, these people that, that have a name, a reputation in our field. They, they have done amazing stuff and they're wonderful role models. They have a, a lot to teach, but your journey is not their journey or the other way around, right? Their journey happened for them because of the things they did and the way they did them. And you as an indie hacker have to find your own individual way to get there, right? It, it has to be your own way. And um, the, there is there are many ways to this. Obviously, you can come up with a wonderful idea and implement it in a, in a spectacular way and then show it to a community and everybody loves it and they use it and you become a star. Obviously, that's not how it works or that's how it works in the, like the rarest of cases. There are cases like this, but that's by far not the majority. The way that I see that is the most realistic, the highest um, success rate having approach to this is when people start from within the community. I, I call this like the embedded entrepreneurship approach. Like you go into a community, you participate in a community that could be the indie hacker community. It could be the software community that you're in, the kind of JavaScript dev that gets your the JavaScript meetups and the JavaScript community. Or maybe you're, you're a Star Trek nerd and you're like in the, the larger Star Trek community and you talk with people about your favorite Star Trek shows all the time or whatever it is. But there, there's always a community of people that you feel drawn to and that you really like to participate in. And if that community is made of and made up of enough people that have issues, that have challenges that they pay money to solve for, then you can start listening to what people are complaining about. So like you look for problems, you look for critical, commonly shared problems that people already show that they have a budget to pay for a solution for. And then over time, you understand the problem space, you understand like where people need more help, what things already work, what things don't work as well. And then you look from the problem into what can you solve? Like how can there be a new way of solving this? Maybe you bring knowledge from another field, right? You you are a software engineer and you go into the, that's, that's kind of my path um, into the authoring, the writing tools, right? Writers are not software engineers. They don't necessarily understand that we have all this incredibly high, highly automated AI tooling that can just facilitate so much for a writer. Most people, most people who write, they just type out every word. Like for a software engineer, that is the, that is the weirdest thing. Like we have auto correct and we have like self expanding text fragments and all that kind of stuff. Normal writers don't know about this. But if you see that there is an opportunity to transfer your engineering knowledge into this writing space, for example, that is when you can provide a new solution to a commonly felt problem. And then you implement that solution in the product. And that should be, like you said, a great product that actually makes people really um, want to buy it because it just helps them so much compared to everything else that's in the market. And that, that path from going into a community, understanding that there is a future audience, a market for you, and then looking at their problems, selecting the critical ones, finding a solution that is new and transfers new skills into that space, and then implementing that so that it fits their existing workflow and is in a medium that they want it to be in, that is the approach that I see most often to work for indie hackers. And those are indie hackers that do a lot of experimentation. They go into different communities. They build different products for different communities. They have the also small bets approach, which has been popularized by Daniel Vassallo, right? Make small little bets and see which one works and then go deeper on the ones that work. And if one doesn't work out, well, just put it to the side and try something else, like diversify in, in a way, but still focus on small niche communities because a niche is a place where people that are 
quite homogenous. They have similar issues, similar goals. They have similar ways of doing things. They have the same issues. They have the same, same critical problems. And once you solve that for one person, they will quickly tell their peers that somebody has to solve that problem. And that is kind of the impetus that you get in your, in your marketing in this community. If you solve a generic problem, you have to compete with everybody else who tries to solve this generic problem. And all of a sudden you have to spend a lot of money that you don't have as an indie, indie founder on marketing, but in a niche community, with niche problems and niche solutions, you can make substantial amounts of money because niche doesn't mean small, right? Niche just means specific. And um, that's, so a niche based audience first or like embedded market first approach tends to be, and again, there's no guarantee in entrepreneurship ever but it tends to be a more reliable path that is more sustainable because you you validate along every step of the way, right? Is there a community? Do they even have problems? Do they even pay for solutions? Like, do they even, are there even products in this space? Every step of the way you validate a little bit more that if you do something, there might be positive resonance to it. And um, that in aggregate means that you have a higher chance of succeeding. Doesn't mean you will, but it means you have a higher chance than just like building the product you always wanted to build and hoping that if you build it, they will come because they tend not to come. At that moment. Well, it's like, I mean, yeah, I mean, what you just described there is is effectively an intrinsic product market fit. You know, you're yeah. trying to test the market and you doing it at a very grassroots level and you're trying to throw stuff onto the dart, onto the wall, throwing darts and seeing what sticks. It's sort of goes back to sort of the, the 80, 20 rule, you know, Give focus on what produces 80% of the outputs. And if it doesn't, then that's okay. Throw that away and, and double down on what's working. And so I think that sort of embedded approach is really interesting because I see that now, not on just in Twitter, but in, in, you know, Reddit and, and all of these other communities mm-hmm. where people are integrating themselves into these types of groups mm-hmm. and just saying, hello, how are you guys? Do you need any help? How can I do something for you? And then say, I'm building something. And then you, it starts to sort of cascade from there, which is really, really exciting because I think now with the whole community taking off creators stuff, indie hackers, there's a lot of opportunity, I would say. And now figuring out what are the nodes that I can connect? Can I create inter-communities between different communities and see what that looks like and, and saying, you know, is there resonance there? And if, if there is, how can I work with those communities as well? You know, that's really interesting. Do you think that, uh, you know, you have your shirt right there, you know, building in public. I think building a public is another massive trend now in, in, in emergence. You know, what's the benefits of building a public and why is it so important for, for especially indie hackers? Yeah, it's, it's kind of building on this embedded entrepreneurship approach, because if you're part of a community, you're having relationships with real people, you're having conversations with people, right? And, and that means that if you ask a question, you usually get an answer. And for anybody who's building a business, being able to ask the people who are gonna or are already using a product ask them a question and getting an answer, that is a qualified feedback that you can act upon, right? So being in this feedback loop, an area of your community where you can establish really substantial feedback loops, that is good for any business because you don't want to like toil away in obscurity for half a year to then release something and people don't care about it, right? That that really sucks. That's your time that's lost, a lot of money is spent on something that nobody needs, and then people are disappointed that they don't get the solution that they actually deserve. So doing this in the community and getting feedback from day one of you actually building it, now that obviously cuts down any kind of this, this, this time delay that you have, right? If you say, I want to build this, and people say, we don't care. Or sure, build it, but I'm probably not going to pay for it. That is qualified feedback. You might still want to build it and build a prototype and wow them, you know, because people what is it like they want faster horses, right? That's, that's always the kind of thing. If you ask them uh, if what they need, like in, in terms of like automotion, that's the, the Henry Ford quote, suppose it Henry Ford quote, but the, the idea that people can, t- can talk to you immediately when you ask them something that is incredibly valuable. And that happens in communities that happens when you already have this relationship as a contributor to the community and people don't see you just as somebody who's trying to sell them something, but actually as somebody who wants to empower and serve the community from the start, that makes it much easier to talk to them and building public just 
sits right there. Building a public is essentially just sharing your story. If you want to build a business, you say, well, I'm, I'm going to try and build something here. I see that people have a problem. I want to solve this problem. I'm probably going to build a solution. Join me on my journey on figuring this out. And usually that is already enough for some people to say, yes, I'm part of this. I want to see where this goes. Just human curiosity, right? We want to see if other people can succeed. You know, there's, there's sometimes a bit of envy. Sometimes you have some Schadenfreude in there as well, but we want to, we want to see like, where is this journey going? And from the start, there is some sort of investment of our attention, of our willingness to help these people out. We want to motivate them. We want to support them. All of this goes into that journey as well. And then you, you just start sharing your progress or lack of progress or your failures or your successes or any kind of thing that happens along the way. And that journey itself helps the business become better because you get feedback on new features that you build on decisions that you make because you tell people about them, right? You said earlier today, I had this just as an example, which is not real, but I, I was thinking about this particular feature and I thought I'm, I might implement it in this particular way. I drew up a couple of, you know, a sketch here and you, you share this on Twitter or LinkedIn or wherever your community is that you're going to be serving. And you said, what do you think about this? And then people say, yeah, this is really cool. Or I totally want to see this. Or now nah, I've seen this done by somebody else. It didn't work. You get feedback that you can then act upon. And it immediately gives you this relationship with people where not only do you tell them what you're doing, they are involved in the project. Like just by, by them saying, yeah, this is cool. They are now part of your business. Like it's, it's a mental thing, right? It's, it's a, um, a cognitive um, dissonance, I guess, but it works. People become part of your business, even though they're not on the, um, the, 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 yeah, in your investment ledger or something. They're just part of the journey. And the benefit of that, obviously, is you get the feedback loops, you get the information and you build a better business. But the secondary effect, which in many ways is even stronger, is that you build a reputation as an expert in the community that will outlast whatever project you're working on. That's one of the best things about building in public is, I can build a business today and it fails two weeks from now, but my reputation in the community is only going to climb because I'm going to be honest about it. I'm going to share with them how it failed, why it failed, what I tried. People are going to try to help me. People are going to commiserate with me. People are going to try to motivate me to keep going. And all of a sudden I start a new project and they're right there and they're going to support me with the next thing. And they're going to talk to all of their friends to make this one succeed. Like you built this this, this leverage in the community as somebody who's doing stuff, right? And, and that is why building in public, even with the smallest of projects, has this cumulative avalanche effect over time that people who've done this for years, Pat Flynn is a great example, right? It runs this amazing podcast, the Smart Passive Income podcast since 2009. Like he's been around for a while and any project that he starts gets this massive immediate support because he's been doing all of his work in public for decades. And Peter Levels, same example. Peter Levels releases a new tool. Like now he's working on AI tools. A couple of years ago, he was working on remote working tools and job boards and all of this stuff. Like by just even talking about his idea, he already has his first 50 or so test customers. That's just like you over time, you build this, this audience and this leverage that all your projects are interesting. It immediately, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. And that's why building in public, if you do it consistently, and that's kind of closing the loop here, I guess. If you don't just do it on occasion, but if you really commit to sharing everything that is worth and uh, safe to share, then your journey will become something that other people attach to, even though they might not even need your business. They might not need your product, but they want to see you succeed because you're a person that is giving to the community. You're contributing even by just talking about your journey, your teaching, because there's always somebody like two weeks or two months behind you. And what you do today is something new for them that they can learn from. So you have this teaching aspect to sharing as well. You can tell I'm excited about this because I just love building in public, right? This is a project that is ongoing. Every day I learn something new. I share it with people. Somebody learns something. Even if it's just a screenshot of something, there's always an opportunity for somebody to learn and that learning translates into reputation for yourself and that translates into a relationship with that person that may or may not be monetized at some point or turn into an opportunity somebody invites you like into into their business you, they ask you to invest into their business or whatever may come your way building in public is just putting yourself out there so that other people can invest in you with money time attention or just support there's this notion of learning from other people around you, but learning in such a way where you're 
not looking, you know, if you've got a, a road ahead of you in front of you that you need to continue to walk down, you know, you don't want to be trying to learn from someone who's light years ahead of you. You want to be some learning from someone who's just two or three steps ahead of you. And then exactly. And then from there, you get motivated and say, Oh, I can, I'm sort of in the right direction. And, and then you can easily pivot here and there based on the feedback. And it's a very quick feedback that you get. And you know, someone's already done it two steps or three steps ahead of you. And you can learn from that as well. And that's a really good way to continue the momentum. And I think that momentum is really important, especially when you build in public and you get the reinforcement back and say, Oh, what I'm doing might be you know, it might be doing some good stuff and I need to, it's like a dopamine hit at the end of the day. And you feel like I want to just continue building this to not, not, not necessarily impress uh, or satisfy people, but I'm doing this because I know there's value in it. And I know I'm getting feedback, very, very quick feedback from the, the community by as well. Yeah, building public has this dual-sided uh, benefit, right? It benefits you. Obviously, it benefits the people that you serve as well because of these faster feedback cycles, but it also benefits your community. So it's kind of a three-pronged approach. Your community gets to follow this journey. They learn from whatever you do. They get inspired by it, and they give that back to you, which then motivates you. It's, it's again, kind of flywheels like a system. And I kind of think that's something we need to find in our lives, the thing that keeps us going and is not just selfish, right? That is something that is both selfish you, you share what you know because you're kind of becoming vulnerable in that moment, right? You share something, you share your decision making process. And hey, if you make a stupid decision, people will say, well, that was a pretty stupid decision, but that just humanizes you because we all make stupid mistakes pretty much all the time. And if people see you as a human being, now they have a relationship with an actual human being, not just with this fake persona that we tend to project when we go into social media, right? So that, that also creates stronger relationships that are more honest. And when it comes to relationships that end in opportunities or that generate opportunities, honesty and trust is a pretty important factor, right? Nobody is going to invite you um, into their circle of people who make might make something happen if they don't trust you. So being an authentic human being in public, sharing the ups and the downs, and sometimes also talking about the mistakes you make, that is that is a, a pretty important part here. And like you said, it helps the people who are right behind you on your journey. And the benefit is like even if you follow somebody else, like Peter Levels or something, somebody else in the community, they are also going, like they keep going, they keep walking down that path and they might take, you know, they might go to the right and you want to go to the left at some point, that's also fine, but everybody is on a journey. And as long as we understand that we all want to be on kind of the same journey, we just started at a different point in time, then it's kind of becomes very clear that the whole community will at some point benefit from anything you have to say. And that's something that I want to want to make very explicit here. If you're listening to this and you think, oh, I just started, what do I have to share? Well, you just started. Or you maybe you didn't start, but you've been thinking about this for a couple months or maybe years now. You are way ahead of most other people already at this point. Even just listening to this conversation puts you in like a, a group of people that is already so concerned with this, that's really want to do something about it compared to everybody else who's just been, yeah, maybe, maybe not. That already puts you ahead of people. And that already makes you a person that has something important to share. It may not be a lot. You might not be able to write a book about it or give, like, turn it into a course or whatever, but you don't need to. You can just share little tidbits of whatever you learned. What did you learn today? What did you learn this week? What did you learn from this conversation? This is something that somebody else will benefit from. And that's the, the kind of the small but important sharing detail that building in public uh, incorporates, at least for me. And I see this all over the place. I love following people who built in public like this. And I think we all benefit from this quite a bit. What about, now let's let's sort of look on the other side of the spectrum. What about if you're a founder and you're introverted? Let's say you're someone who, you know, is really capable, who has a great idea and wants to start building, but they're kind of unsure mm -hmm. about their exposure. And you said before, you know, you are in some cases put in a vulnerable, very vulnerable situation. How do you work with, or what's advice that you can share with introverted founders who want to, you know, share their stuff with the world, but they're kind of scared? You know, what, what's your thoughts on that? So um, I did a Myers Briggs test a couple of years ago, and I think I scored INTP. And the I is for introverted. So supposedly, 
I'm an introvert myself. And, and that made me think, right? I, I, I come from a technical background. I come from a like, software engineering, kind of nerd community kind of thing where everybody is effectively <laughs> introverted or most people are. But I noticed that um, in the community of my peers, when I talk to other founders, when I talk to other indie hackers, my introversion shrinks away and my, my interest at explaining to people what I love comes out. And I think if you go to any meetup for a thing that you like, be that like programming or like model planes or you, you like history or something, you go to a place where people talk about this, nobody will be like a complete introvert in that community because people just can't help sharing what they love with other people who they know love the same thing. And I feel online communities like the Indie Hacker community or the, the Build in Public Indie Hacker subgroup, right? That's the exact same space. Like you, you will find pe people like you that are also usually shy in social settings. I, I hate parties. Maybe I can put that in here. It may not seem like that here that I'm talking about these things in, in this very energetic way, but that is, that is my, my little sliver of extroversion lives in talking to other people who love entrepreneurship and indie hacking. That's why I, I get really excited and why I can not stop sharing, but I consider myself introverted in most other ways as well. So. But I learned that in this sliver of space, I can drop all my shyness and all my reservations and just share who I am because the people around me will understand that. So that that is my personal, subjective and unique perspective. I wrote about this a couple of months ago and I had an interview um, with, with Anna Bibikova. We talked a lot about introversion on this. That's that's in, on my podcast as as well where it's really about like, how do you approach communication? How do you manage your energy with this stuff? And where do you draw the line? Like, where do you set limit and, uh, uh, limits and boundaries? And boundaries are very important, particularly when you become vulnerable in public. And one misconception that I see a lot is that people think, well, if I start building in public, I have to share everything. That is not true. Like you share what you wanna share and nothing more. Right? If you don't want to talk about it, if you feel like I don't want to talk about this, this is kind of embarrassing. Maybe you should talk about it, but you by far don't have to. Like if you don't want to share something, you don't have to. But it it will help you to kind of push yourself a little bit and see what happens. And most of the time, nothing happens because people know what you're talking about, right? If you have something that you're slightly embarrassed about, people will resonate with that because people are embarrassed about everything all of the time. But you can only understand that if you kind of push yourself a little bit and, and poke at other people and see that nothing really happens. But I would recommend like listening to that podcast because Anna can talk about this much better than I can. She did a, a lot of research on this topic. Um, but my personal advice is to push yourself a little bit. But if you want to keep things private, Keep things private, share only what you're willing to share and maybe set really clearly defined boundaries, make a checklist of things that you want to share, a checklist of things that you want to keep private. And if you ever see something that is worth talking about, check on what side it is and then act uh, according to that. That's great advice. And now I'll try to link the uh, episode and the entire podcast in the show notes below as well. One last thing on sort of, you know, before we sort of digress into another topic, and is really the idea of mental health. I think burnout, mental health is very important to me. You know, working in tech, working with founders in tech, investing in founders in tech, it's, it's very, you know, you start to see uh, a commonality amongst some of them. And you notice that there, there is sometimes a, a, you know, a hint of burnout or they're suffering and they're not really telling people about it. You know, how important is mental health to you? I think I saw a, Twitter a long time ago, well, not so long, probably late last year, but there was a um, someone on Hacker News and they were sort of just saying, look, I gave up. I don't know what to do now. And I've, I've, I've tried to do this three times and I don't know what I'm doing wrong. And that's a, that's a, like, that's a, that's a sucker punch. That's a really tough for a lot of people. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of other people are feeling like that. Yeah. How do you get over that hump? How do you, continue to be determined and persevere in building something that you love, but you're not getting the feedback that you expect. If only I had an answer to this, I, I, I can only kind of share my personal approaches to this, but I also know that they won't be generalizable. I, I have found that I'm a, 
accountability makes me peer, like do more and you kind of hinted at that earlier right with with me like if, if somebody wants to read my work because they subscribe to my newsletter then i put it in even though sometimes i may not feel like writing that week but i know somebody out there is really waiting for that email and i know that this is technically not the case but in my mind you know it constructs this accountability regimen that helps me but let, let's maybe talk about mental health um, in a more general way here for founders, it, it is always hard, particularly hard when they, they have constraints in their life that make them feel like they need to succeed. That is, that is one of the things that causes burnout and causes like depression and, and other anxiety, stress, like more than anything else. I'm not a psychologist, so it's my perception here. And this is, this is not medical advice, but, um, or even medical insight. It's just personal, personal insight that I have from looking at the community at large. And that is when people quit their job and then they want to be indie hackers and then they need to build something to sustain their life. That is the most stressful potential situation you could put yourself into. And I think the best thing for your own mental health is not to ever do this. I, I think I see so many people who who that struggle and like the, the, that indie hacker post. I can remember how I felt. I was really sad, like for that person and for all the other people who commented with, and saying, "Yeah, I feel like this too," or I've experienced something like that too. Like that that was um, that, that hacker news post was really um, eye opening to how common it is that people feel like this. And one way to avoid it is by having a job, by by taking indie hacking as a side project, as an approach to, uh, um, or taking the approach of the side project to indie hacking. Maybe that's a better phrase because you don't need to quit your job to become an indie hacker. You only need to be able to do work outside of your job legally, which is what you know some non competes don't allow you to do, or some some contracts uh, you have to be really clear with your employer about this kind of work. But doing it on the side and having a regular income is usually a much less stressful way of becoming an indie hacker. And then at some point you're gonna go full time and then the reality of business will happen to you and you might have more stress or more anxiety depending on which industry you're in. If you were a developer building a Twitter tool, then the last couple of days or last couple of weeks or last month um, have been really stressful to you, right? Because Twitter's API pricing changes and them banning projects and unbanning them and, you know, making it harder to use and all that kind of stuff. If your product is built on Twitter right now, you are not having a good time. Side project or main project doesn't really matter. It's, it's not an enjoyable time, but that will always be the case if you have a business that you depend on. So the further you can push this into your future that you really need to depend on this and the more you can build this Build the muscle of building, being an indie hacker, building software for your own projects, for your own businesses, the further you can do this while still having a sustaining income from another, could be freelancing too. It doesn't have to be a full-time job. It could be project work on, I don't know, Upwork or wherever you go nowadays to do these projects. Um, that will cause you a different kind of stress that is by far not as life-threatening as the one you feel that if I cannot make this project work this month, I'm going to lose the house. That's, you know, that's the kind of level. But honestly, yeah, I don't really know what to say. I, I, I wish I could help people overcome their mental health issues more. I think maybe one thing is to talk about the, these problems with people who've been through them. That may be the, the best advice that I can give here. Our community, our indie hacker community is full of people who've been through burnout multiple times, me included. I've been there twice, been there in my in a regular job, and I've been there as an indie hacker. So if you have burnout, if you are afraid of having burnout, just reach out to me on Twitter and we can talk about this. I'm usually very open about this topic and I'm trying to help people that you know have this issue because I know how hard it is to, to get out of it and to recover from it. I've thought about it a lot. I've written about it a lot. So we can always talk about this. So please reach out to me. My DMs are open on Twitter. But um, if you have this, you can talk to people. You can share that you're struggling with this. And you will find in this community people that are observant enough to help you in that moment because they know what it feels like. And there are a lot of peers in our community who are invested in making our community better by being there for people like you in this moment. So 
The community is what helped me get through this multiple times, other problems too. And you, you're not alone in this. Maybe that's the important part. Mental health is often a problem because we look at it in isolation because it happens in our minds and we're too afraid, too embarrassed, too shy to talk to other people about it. We don't go to therapy because for some reason people don't go to therapy and we don't talk to our spouses because we don't want to overburden them. We don't talk to our family because we don't want to disappoint them. And all these reasons that we make up not to talk about it, talk about it to your peers. Talk about it anonymously if you have to. Talk, to, talk about it from your real account if you can and find help and solace in the fact that there are people out there who went through this, came through it and now have the capacity to help you go through it as well. Good advice. I think everyone will have their own journey, but also I think community is really important and and you know sharing your story is, is really important too. And people will finally realize that, look, I'm not alone and I could now start to engage who are, you know, experiencing what I'm experiencing and, you know, being alone is probably the last thing you want and, yeah. and you want to make sure that you're surrounded by people who can support you whether it be your online community but even just your close friends your family you know be open about that and don't don't sort of hide these things and that's one thing that i've been trying to sort of convey to sort of the founders that i work with and sort of you know the stuff that i've been through in the past um it does you know it's, it's not a good place to be in. and i think um, finding solace in that is really helpful with Twitter. So let's let's dig into a little bit of Twitter because I think you're a big Twitter guy, but I'd love to learn a bit more about the brand building you've done. You are a PR machine in a good way, and I think you have done really good stuff in building a following, but an engaging following. It's not random people who are following you. These are people that you've helped, that you interact with. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about the strategy you've employed on and this will probably help a lot of other people trying to grow their own audience on social media is what's the best way to grow a following on social media it's the same way that is the best way to grow a business um and, and any SaaS business or anything like it very slowly and very sustainably that is something that i've tried to do from the beginning so that also means that i've completely avoided any kind of attempt at being viral on twitter in any way I don't want to go viral on Twitter. I just don't care about it. I don't write threads that might go viral. I just don't do it because I don't like it and I don't do it. I don't engage in like follow for follow or retweeting groups or whatever weird hacks people do today to get more followers or get more engagement or exposure. I'm, I'm a big, big opponent of growth hacks in many ways. I know that growth hacking technically is not about cheating or manipulating people. It's just the idea of optimizing a system for growth. But the way I see growth hacks, and I mean this in quotation marks, I guess, the kind of growth hacks I don't like are the ones that are purely selfish and highly manipulative, right? Running contests that never pay out, like promising people you're in a, in a, I don't know, a draw for a MacBook Pro that you never deliver to anybody just to get people to follow you or follow me and send me a DM to get this, this ebook or something. I just don't like these things. I'm not a fan. And I very clearly communicate this. And I think I show it through how I communicate on Twitter, which to me is I tweet about the things I care about. I engage a lot with people in conversations. I, I try to do way more engagement and amplification of other people's content than I try to do writing stuff about myself or writing my own tweets. You will probably find if you, if you put my account in any like statistics analysis tools, if they are still able to function now that Twitter is closing the API, that I have a, a retweet ratio of like over 50%. I think over 50% of what I do on Twitter is just retweeting other people's work. Because I, I have thought, I, and that's from the beginning when I just had 400 followers uh, in 2019 when I started my Twitter journey, painfully accumulated over 10 years on Twitter, just, you know, random friends and, and people that you had a chat with over a decade. Um, I thought, well, if I have this platform of even 400 people, I think somebody else is going to benefit way more from me retweeting it to my just 400 people than from me writing my own thing. Like just a reply or something. So I've always been very retweet focused because I think it is really cool to, to expose my followers to something I care about and to expose the person that wrote the thing that I care about to my followers. 
you know, it's kind of introducing them to each other. So you're connecting people. That's how I see Twitter. So when I, when I communicate with somebody, um, when somebody has a question, I don't know the answer. I tend to try and find the person that I remember that may have the answer and I pull them into the conversation. So I kind of connect these two people. Or when I have something to share, I try to pull in the resource that gives people an opportunity to, you know, read the, the Wikipedia entry to the thing that I'm refer referring to or the blog article that I read about a couple of years ago that might help them with this problem. I just to pull in information, right, to zoom into the problem or try to zoom out and give them a, a different perspective on the problem that they're talking about, kind of have these, these kind of two modes, right? I zoom into the problem, I zoom out of the problem, or I engage, I bring people into the conversation or I disseminate the conversation to more people. Those four vectors that kind of exist, or two vectors, but it doesn't matter. Don't need to be too technical here. The the idea is that I I try to very actively contribute meaningfully to every single conversation, and it's that that is the part I contribute to ongoing conversations. And this is the tip that I always give to people who ask me how they can get started on Twitter. Nobody is going to read your tweet if you only have five followers. Quite literally, nobody's going to read it because not even those five people will see it on their activity feed. If you're lucky, one of the five will see it because they also follow a couple other hundred or thousand people. So your thing might be in there, might not even make it into the activity feed. So if you just tweet with no followers, nobody's going to read it. But if you have something to say, and this is central, this is critical, if you have something to say, not just saying something for the sake of saying something, but if you have something meaningful to contribute to a conversation, if you go to somebody else's conversation, you are immediately exposed to the person who started the conversation, to the people who are currently contributing to the conversation themselves, who are chatting with that person, and to everybody in the future is going to read this on their timelines. And that can be tens, dozens, hundreds, and hundreds of thousands of people, depending on who you're having a conversation with. So much more impact just by going to somebody else's conversation. And that, I think, is the biggest misconception that people have about Twitter. It's about tweeting. It's not. It's about replying. And it's about replying in, again, a meaningful, contributing way. Don't be a reply guy, somebody who's just jumping onto somebody else's tweets to be first, you know, and type something just to act like they are engaged. It's not going to help. People are too smart to, to see you for, or what you are doing at that moment. But actually try to think, okay, I follow these all these cool people with a lot of followers. They bring interesting conversations up. They participate in interesting conversations. What can I bring to this? And be critical. Like if you don't have anything to say, then don't. Like make you the things you have to say or the things you, you reply to other people with, make them count, make them be something that invites other people into your following. Because what you're effectively doing is you're auditioning in front of somebody else's audience. Like it's quite literally an audience audition that you're doing with everything you post when you contribute to somebody else's conversation. Because if the thing you say is kind of interesting, then they might look at your profile and see, oh yeah, this person is about that. They have this bio. They say they have done this in the past. They are currently working on this. Interesting, follow. If they see you have a couple of interesting tweets, a good pin tweet with something that makes you either smart or relatable or kind or gives people some more insight in, to, into whatever you have to say and what you have to share. If people see this and they see, hey, is a real human being with a real name and a real avatar picture of themselves that is contributing to a real conversation with that other real person that I know, this is a person I would like to follow. And that has been the, the basic of all my actions on Twitter to this day. I still treat everybody on Twitter as a peer, as somebody else that I might, you know, hang out at a meetup with or just have a chat with. I, even though I have a hundred thousand followers at this point, I try desperately to interact with everybody who wants to interact with me because I know that this is why I use Twitter. So I have these conversations. I want that. That's why I, I'm on this platform to be able to converse with people like this. And that's why I still engage with these things and very rarely tweet out something. And I'm more, more or less replying and retweeting most of the time. And that is a crash course in building your audience for Twitter, ladies and gentlemen. That was awesome. That was incredible. And I think all the stuff you just mentioned is, is stuff that, you know, people should try to do and, and not just to uh, do it for the sake of, you know, trying to get clickbait or anything like that and building genuine relationships and, and seeing what value you can provide. I, I think, you know, building an audience is hard and just mm -hmm. like building a business, you know, it takes yeah. time, takes effort. And yes. I think with that you can really, it's a testament to seeing how many people have, you know, if you look at profiles on Twitter, you say, well, why, how does this 
how does this person have half a million followers? Well, if you look at what day they started, they started in 2008 and they have, you know, 50,000 tweets. That's probably why it's not an overnight success. And you just got to be completely consistent and sort of goes back to the overarching topic that we talked about is like, you know, just be consistent, show up, do something that's meaningful and has value. And then, you know, everything will fall, the chips will fall as they may, and, and everything will just be uh, worked towards you. Um, let's talk about, about software. I, I think, you know, me as an engineer, I'm always keen to sort of see, you know, I've been a bit out of touch with the latest languages, but I'd like to understand a bit more about some of the things that you've been keeping up with, with regards to software and engineering, you know, what are you doing nowadays, you know, uh, but also, are there any interesting stuff that you've been looking into? Obviously, AI is very big right now. ChatGPT, OpenAI. You know, what's going to be something that gets uh, sort of getting you excited right now in, in the world of, of software engineering? Any new languages? Any new frameworks, tools that you can sort of uh, dispel to the audience about, you know, what you're looking into? Honestly, the the older I get, <laughs> and this is always a good start to an argument. No, but I, I feel like I'm less focused on a novelty. What I'm currently trying to figure out is interoperability. That's something that I'm really excited about between all these tools. Because what I see in, in terms of, of software businesses, people succeed the most when they build things that connect things with each other. You know, like the, the businesses that stay around, even when platforms like banish them from, from Twitter, like what we had a couple of weeks ago, or when, um, some new thing comes along, the things that stick around and that are profitable and that are really solving problems are things that, that connect things with each other. So why Sapier is such a big deal or why, why APIs are everywhere all over the place. That's why, why the world changed when ChatGPT or GPT-4 or OpenAI, I guess, opened up APIs for their products because now people could build on top and with these things. And, and that is what excites me. Really doesn't, doesn't, I, I don't really care what specific technological implementation it has as long as it allows people from all different backgrounds to interoperably connect their tools with each other. Because I think that's where the, the most network effect comes in. And if there's one thing that is a self-sustaining loop, it's the network effect, right? Where every addition to the network improves the value of the network more than just the individual value of that addition. It's kind of the sum is bigger than the, right, the whole is bigger than the sum of its parts situation. And that is what interoperability allows for. And I'm, I'm particularly interested in technology that enables you to build things that connect with things without having to build on top of them. Because again, platform risk is something that I've been talking about a lot over the last couple of months because it's been such a prominent thing on Twitter, but also with OpenAI, with the OpenAI with ChatGPT and with GPT-4 or GPT-5 when this airs or GPT-6 or GPT-7, I don't know. Like uh, in a couple of weeks from now, we could be looking at a double digit situation here. But these platforms, they all... They're all owned by like private entities and they have complete control over the platform and who operates on the platform, who's allow, allowed to connect to the platform or how much to use it. That's, that's the, the crux of, of all these problems lies with the, the fact that these are privately held, very access limited platforms. What I would like to see is more open interoperable platforms that use or leverage the same technology, but are way more easy to connect to and allow for you know less revenue centric usage of the tools that exist and um also allow for you know ngos and and other not necessarily profit oriented businesses to operate in and these are the technologies that i'm interested in right now when it comes to ai i love the open source approach to trying to imitate and or reverse engineer gpd4 like the, the language models and trying to find out what exact com combination of parameters and settings you need to get a model somewhat like this and stable diffusion for generative uh, AI and how you can get the, the, the model to train it on, on your own images instead of having it trained on a corpus of images that is very likely involved in copyright infringement. All of these things are extremely interesting the moment they are taken away from these private entities and moved into the open source or at least, you know, the, the, the software engineering community at large. 
that's that's technology that I'm interested in. Alternative models, alternative weights, alternative parameters, people experimenting with these things. So exciting right now. I don't have, unfortunately, enough time to run these things myself on my computer. Although I use um, OpenAI's Whisper. That's a that's something that they actually released, which is um, a, t a speech to text tool where you can just throw a media file in there and it's going to generate like subtitle file or um, some, some kind of... Um, yeah, just uh, yeah, the text of that, uh, what was said. And that I run locally on all my videos, for example, that I just recorded for myself. So I have something, a basic uh, subtitle to put in there until my actual transcription human person does the job of going through the thing. And then I see quite a, a difference in, in quality. Obviously, the human does it, still does it a bit better than a machine, which probably is also because I'm a, um, not a native language English speaker. But, you know, there's there's still a lot of, a lot of space there in that field, but I'm excited by the technology and I love the fact that it's available to be to as an open source project. So when it comes to this, that's, that's what I'm currently looking into. Yeah. I, I mean, there's, you know, open source used to be so taboo a while ago. And, and I think the only thing was sort of, sort of Linux was the only thing that was really uh, going hard on, on open source. But now with, you know, Twitter open sourcing their algorithm mm -hmm. and, you know, starting to see a bit more transparency, I think it's going to be really exciting to see exactly where this goes because there's going to be an influx of, and we're already seeing it now with the developers coming into open API. They're sort of tinkering around and seeing what can actually be done. And they want that because it fuels the ecosystem. And right. that in and of itself is a community. And yes. so you start to then create a critical mass around that movement. And who knows, you know, there'll be fixes and bugs and all those things that will be raised and hopefully make the system a bit more, um, you know, decentralized, so to speak, but also a, a bit more open, you know, at the end of the day so that everyone can at least understand a little bit of how, how it works. What's the, um, you know, just tailing off here with the, the software stuff. Is it important for people, for kids to sort of learn software? You know, I think software is such a, it's an awesome skill to have, right? You're building code and, you know, I think, you know, not everyone has to do it, but I think this, in this day and age, at least you need to have a basic understanding, in my opinion, of, you know, fundamentals. I think, I believe AI should be taught, not the technical AI, but AI ethics and AI yes. understanding what AI is should be taught in schools. But at the same time, do you think that people should learn, you know, software and, and, and learn how to develop, to build a bit of code, um, you know, at least to understand this is how the world operates now. And if you're not going to understand this, then you might be left behind. What are your thoughts around that? I think like, you, you put on, like, you, you talk about two, two distinct, but connected things. Like everybody should understand how technology works. They don't necessarily need to be able to instruct a machine to do a certain thing. It would be great if everybody understood how to code because that would give people a lot of freedom and a lot of competence to solve their own problems, which in turn would allow them to be more, you know, self sustainable or um, determined in, in doing their own thing. But understanding the, the functional level of this is, is just a safety and security thing. It's like when you try to teach your, your aging parents not to click on emails with random links in them, right? Any kind of, basic understanding of of how a link works or how an email works is required for this right people cannot judge if they don't know how to judge it so for solid judgment and that is something that in the age of ai humans are it's kind of the last bastion of humanity is the the, the capacity to judge right because machines are really not that good at judging because they they can only like make true or false statements that are kind of implied in some logic but as a human you can take a step back and employ different perspectives and and judge the thing so to be able to judge you need to have the knowledge to make a judicious choice and that knowledge should definitely be taught ai ethics is something that should be not just taught but even considered if you think if you think about google who kind of fired their whole AI ethics research team a couple of years ago, or, you know, people suppressing that kind of research because it doesn't align with their business interests. That's a big problem. I remember when I went to university for computer science and then later successfully dropped out, we had a course that was not AI ethics, but it was software development ethics. And we were, to we were talking about, well, if you ever have a job and you work for the military and they want you to code, 
like a ballistic rocket missile, something like that. Is that something you would be interested in? Like, let's talk about this, right? And we had this conversation about um, what it means to write code that could potentially be used for arms, for weapons. And there, there are licenses out there in the open source community that that allow for any anybody to use it as long as it's not used for warfare. Like there are specifics that people have in, in that regard. And it was just interesting to even think about this because as a software developer, you don't really think much about the potential misuse of your code. But the moment you, you give your code to somebody else, they could just use it for everything that they want to use it for, right? So understanding how code works or how intellectual property works or how the, the, the design of an algorithm works and where it can go wrong and what impacts it may have on a society, that is stuff that we should definitely introduce to people in the first place and much earlier than we do now. Because people's contact with technology probably is like when they're like, what, five, six years old, seven years old? Like that's when people get, get their kids their first mobile phones that they can kind of, you know, check in with them from school or something. And, and the moment you give people an internet connected phone, you need to start teaching them what potential weapon they're holding in their hands, right? What powerful device that is. So yes, definitely. Second question, the more technical one, should people learn to code? I am super biased as a software developer. So my answer is yes, of course. Like that, on, honestly, I was 13 or 14 years old when I, I got my first computer and I booted the thing up and I was like Microsoft DOS back in the day, slightly dating myself here, but it was a command line and I was like starting Windows like 3.11 or something. It was the good old days. But what I noticed very quickly I, is I can type something into this machine and then it does what I wanted to do. And I think from that day on, I felt like a god in that regard. Because to be able to instruct a machine that can do something that would take you a year, a big calculation or writing something now with AI, and the machine does it in seconds, that is the power of a god. Like if you explain what we're currently doing to somebody, if you time travel like 200 years ago into the past, and you explain to these people that, yeah, I tell I told the machine to write like a 3,000 word article on, uh, I don't know, like a complicated chemistry subject, and it returned like within 10 seconds, a full article with the drawings and everything like correct, they're, they're just going to look at you and they're going to fall on their knees and start praying, right? That's what's going to happen. Because the reality is that what we're currently doing is the work of gods compared to what we were able to, be do, to, to do before. And that is like amplified by your capacity to instruct the machine better. And no matter if it's software engineering or being able to do use no code tools to glue them together into something that resembles what a software engineer would be able to produce or even prompt engineering, the new thing right, that everybody's talking about where you learn how to specifically instruct a uh, chat based or uh, and any kind of input based uh, token input based uh, generative AI system like ChatGPT or um, Midjourney or whatever. Learning how to prompt, how to correctly ask the right question to get the good results. Any of this to me is coding because coding is just writing for machines, and it doesn't matter if it's writing code or writing prompts or clicking things. All of this is instructing machines, and that, like regular writing for people. Writing for people, something you should learn. Writing for machines, something you should also learn. So let's generalize this. You should write more. You should write for yourself, for reflection. You should write for others to show what you can do. You should write for machines to instruct them to do what you want to do. And all of this combined is effective writing. And that's a skill that will just level up your life. Uh, well said. I think that's, I agree. I'm biased as well, but you know, it, it's the way the world is going and it's inevitable. So don't be left behind at the end of the day. And if it, software engineering may not be in your career path at all, but if you can prove and you can say, look, I, I, I know what that is. I know what that means. You know, that's going to put you far ahead than, than, you know, 99% of the population who have chosen not to do it. So, you know, it's those marginal gains. And when you're young as well, you absorb a lot more. Yeah. So it's probably the best way, the best time to learn is when you're much younger um, to do that. Uh, let's tail it off. I think we're, we're really hitting 90, 96 minutes here now. So we're really, in, I'm, I'm enjoying the conversation. Uh, what, you're a voracious reader. You read a lot. Uh, you write a lot. But, what are some great books you can recommend to people? And this doesn't have to be about indie hacking or anything mm -hmm. like that, but if there's anything that you could recommend 
as good life lessons, things that have helped you along the way become a better person, a better uh, entrepreneur, a better leader? Um, what are some sort of maybe you know a couple books that you could recommend, or even you know podcast or anything like that? What do you what do you suggest? Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> oh man, I, I've been. I've been reading a lot, like all, all over the place. And I found that the things that help me find myself the most aren't nonfiction books at all. Like, I mean, there are amazing nonfiction books, right? There are um, like the one thing is a great book, like fo focusing on certain things or, and people may not like to hear this, but Malcolm Gladwell's books are great books. They may not be the most scientifically accurate ones and, you know, but they popularize certain themes that if you research them more, you will start to understand like the actual science behind them. Like popular science is still science, may not be as accurate, but it's still interesting. So I love reading those. But when it comes to books that really like formed me, that has all been fiction. That has been like science fiction and fantasy. Like most recently, I've been reading um, the Stormlight Archives by Brandon Sanderson, which is a massive amount of really huge like fantasy tomes, like thousands of pages per book. But I find that even in these books, there is entrepreneurial instruction. If you look at it through the lens of a founder or as a creator, you will find characters that you will just resonate with and you will find their problems described in fiction to be quite representative of the problems that you have in your life. And you're trying not to disappoint your loved ones. You're trying to reach that goal, but there's always something in the way and you have to kind of sneak around and overcome it by changing your perspective, not just on the problem, but on yourself. I find fiction allows me to look beyond the merely instructional part where people write for me as if I was a machine. It's kind of coding for people, right? The, the most nonfiction books are other people tell you exactly what to do and how to do it and why, but they don't contextualize it. You have to contextualize it yourself. And fiction allows me to contextualize somebody else's story in my life and thereby learning what they are learning in, in the, the context of my own experience. So I would recommend just finding fiction you like. Read the Harry Potter books for that matter. I mean, there, there's always a lot of con controversy about those right now, but they allow me to just kind of escape into a world of make-believe, what if, and extrapolate back into my own world from there. So f fantasy, sci-fi, that's, that's my kind of world. Um, and for anything else, like for entrepreneurial books, I, I've really enjoyed like Built to Sell. That has been pivotal for me, that book. Also by John Warlow. It's the second Warlow book I'm recommending here. I'm not affiliated. There is not an affiliate link or anything. But um, I, John is also from Toronto. He, maybe, he I, Being on his podcast was one of the crowning achievements um, on Built to Sell radio is the show because I've always been an admirer of his work. And I, before we sold our business, I would listen to like hundreds of episodes of that podcast to be able to understand how to exit your company. So I, if, you, if you have a couple of weeks to spare, I highly recommend doing that as well. Danielle and I, I think, are on that show together. But um, he, yeah, Built to Sell is a book that changed my perspective on business. It changed my perspective on what a business should look like because... I was always under the impression that a business has to have a certain kind of structure and, it, uh, you know, like what do you think when you start out, you have this, this pers perspective. But what I learned from Built to Sell was that a, a sellable business is a good business and the well-running business and the well-running business is a good business and that is a sellable business. So the idea of organizing a business so that it's well-documented, highly automated, and that you can remove yourself from the business, that came to me from reading this book. And ever since I did that, which was fortunately before we started Feedback Panda, all our efforts went into making Feedback Panda as sellable a business without necessarily needing to sell it. And that book really helped with that. The other book that helped with that was the E-Myth by, by uh, what's his name, Michael E. Gerber, um, The Entrepreneurial Myth, which is also helpful. That's where we got the idea with the, the, the company org chart from. That is explicitly mentioned in the E-Myth, so I recommend that too. Um, but yeah, those two books, I think they gave me this perspective on, oh yeah, that's what a sellable business, a good business looks like. And then we built that business and then we sold it. And now I'm sitting here um, in my own home, in my little studio, talking about business. And that is my life now. So, you know, it, it led me to where I want it to be. So read fiction and read the books that are written by people who you want to be like. <laughs> Maybe that is the most helpful thing I can say. But imitate those that live the life that you want to live. And read the books of those that have written about it. Well said. I think that's great advice. And a lot of stuff has to be, you know, you, you learn a lot through reading 
for me, it's autobiographies. I love reading people's yeah, stories, cool. especially the great leaders, and and knowing how they did. And it, it it just so happens that I you find out that it, history repeats itself, and there's some common traits that exist between these great people. And mm -hmm. and you know, nonfiction is uh, fiction is a great way. It's, it's a good escape as, as well, and to sort of you know, I think a lot of the stories from fiction are taken from the real world and yes. sort of extrapolated out That's to make right. it seem, but it, it has some symbolic meaning back Very to much. us as human beings and the way we interact with each other and, and the world we live in. Uh, Arvid, thank you so much, man. I really appreciate the conversation. I'd, I'd love to sort of, uh, you know, showcase the work that you've been doing and it's been fun to sort of learn a bit more about your journey, uh, but also all the advice and tips that you've given throughout this entire conversation. I'm sure a lot of people will be listening to this and will hopefully be motivated, will be inspired by just doing their own thing and just giving it a grow. And I think that's the, probably the most important thing at the end of the day. So I really appreciate it. And uh, thanks for your time. Absolute pleasure. I love talking about this, as you can probably tell. Thanks for taking this time and talking to me about all these things. I really appreciate it too. Thank you everyone for tuning into this episode. If you like this episode, be sure to check out more by subscribing to the podcast on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and more. Thanks for listening, and I'll catch you next time.